With that, uh, welcome everybody to tonight's program. This is our emerging role for ctDNA in the management of early stage breast cancer. Uh, as you know, uh, it's become relatively standard for early stage colon cancer and being explored in other areas. And uh, we're going to have Dr. Parsons give us an update on what's happening in breast cancer. Dr. Parsons is an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and part of the breast oncology group there. And uh, Heather, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much, and thanks everyone. It's it's good to see it's good to see you all this evening. I hope I'll convince you that there is an emerging role, but it's we're not quite there in terms of uh, using this in the clinic day to day, but hopefully very soon. Um, so show you my disclosures. Um, and so just quickly an overview, we'll talk first just about blood-based biomarkers in general, because they are not new to us, although this, is, um, it, this stuff is ex pretty exciting. What is circulating tumor DNA and how can we use it? Um, using circulating tumor DNA or ctDNA to track minimal residual disease in early breast cancer, and then potential future directions for ctDNA in early breast cancer. So this is a, a definition from the uh, NCI now from six years ago, but thinking about liquid biopsy generally. So a test done on a sample of blood to look for cancer cells from a tumor that are circulating in the blood or CTCs, we're not talking about CTCs here, or for pieces of DNA from tumor cells that are in the blood, CTDNA. Liquid biopsy may be used to find cancer at an early stage, may also be used to help plan treatment or to find out how well treatment is working or if the cancer has come back. Being able to take multiple samples of blood over time may also help doctors understand what kind of molecular changes are taking place in a tumor. I think this is a helpful place to start in just thinking and really grounding us in what are we gonna do with the test and so why are we using it? So short history of breast cancer biomarkers. Again, these are blood-based biomarkers which have been a, the holy grail for some time. They're not new, but hopefully the ones we have now are somewhat better. Um, we know about CA15-3, CA2729. These measure products of the MUC1 gene, whereas CEA, which we can also use in breast cancer, measures oncofetal protein. These all have low sensitivities and low specificities for early stage disease. And their recommendation in, the, in many guidelines is to not use these in early stage disease. They do have utility in tracking metastatic disease in some patients, but they are also not super sensitive in that setting. And so more sensitive, more specific tests are needed. So what about looking for cancer in the blood or pieces of cancer in the blood? We, we talked about blood-based myomarkers here, um, but what is different now is that our te current technologies that we have available are orders of magnitude more sensitive, but also very importantly, and this is, is this hugely important as we think about how to use these tests, our current therapies are more effective. And without effective therapies, a highly sensitive test is not worth all that much. Um, and you see on the right here, just as an example of why, why the, we need both of these things, this is a, a very um, uh, ambitious study from a few years ago from SWOG that looked at using CTCs and the, and the lack of change in CTCs uh, in patients with advanced breast cancer to guide treatment switch. And they compared that to standard uh, care and as you can see, there was no difference in either progression-free survival or in overall survival in these patients. And, um, and there, the, but the standard of care at the time was single agent chemotherapy. So hopefully our approaches now will be better, but we, we need to test them. So what is cell-free DNA and where does it come from? So some definitions, cell-free DNA is double-strand DNA fragments that are associated with histones in circulation that have been released by cells, either through apoptosis, necrosis, or just shedding. The biology here is not fully understood, but this is, this is sort of a, a general overview, and there's a lot of work being done in that space. Cir circulating tumor DNA, or ctDNA, is cell-free DNA or CF DNA that's derived specifically from cancer cells. And it's characterized by somatic cancer-specific alterations, and that's why these tests are so specific. Most CF DNA is actually released by normal leukocytes. So uh, emphasizing that the signal to noise ratio on these tests is challenging and why the sensitivity for the tests um, must be so um, high. And higher levels of CTDNA are associated with 
a higher burden of disease with liver metastases and with certain cancer subtypes in breast cancer specifically, triple negative breast cancer is a higher shedding tumor, if you will, than uh, uh, hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer. So CTDNA is a rich source of cancer specific information. We have mutations that we can look at. We can look at gene fusions. Uh, we can look at copy number alterations, particular, particularly amplifications, as well as DNA methyl methylation, all of which can be used um, to, uh, to gather information about a particular patient's cancer. But the assays vary very quite significantly in the, both the breadth and depth of sequencing. So if you think about wanting to look at um, on the top here, if you look at high nucleotide coverage, so that would be something like whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing, where you're really getting a lot of information about the cancer, but you can't go very deep. So if there's not very much CT DNA around, you, you might not be able to find it. It's unlikely that that test will work very well um, in, in it for a patient's cancer. Whereas on the bottom, the other extreme, if you're looking at a very um, low coverage, but very, se sequencing very deeply a few lo loci, that gives you more information about very rare um, events, rare pieces of, of DNA in the blood. And that's really where we're emphasizing and where these tests are working in, um, in early disease. So we think this could, could have utility across the disease spectrum, all the way from screening and diagnosis to, to detecting resistance um, and everywhere in between, including treatment monitoring and MRD detection. But it really all comes down to what do you want to know and how, therefore how you should use the specific test at hand and which test to use. So, when you think about what we're wanting to know, we first want to know our CT DNA and the tumor that uh, showing us the same thing. And this is from some work that we did um, with my colleague at the Broad, Victor Adelsteinson, a few years ago, just looking at the concordance between a tumor's um, sequencing and sequencing of the cell-free DNA at the same time. And you can see on the left here that there was a high, whoops, high uh, overlap between um, the SNVs detected in the tumor as well as those in the in the um, in the blood. And if you look at the um, the non uh, the subclonal variants, you see less of that, which is as you would expect. One big challenge in circulating tumor DNA interpretation is is clonal hematopoiesis or CHIP. It's very common. It's associated with increasing age and smoking. And commonly altered CHIP-associated genes also overlap with common somatic alterations. So we know that um, simultaneous genomic DNA analysis can enable correction for CHIP, and this is usually done when we're thinking about early breast cancer testing, but is often not done in the advanced cancer setting. So just a word of caution here, um, and that it should, should specifically be um, a tissue agnostic test should be interpreted with caution specifically when thinking about ATM, BRCA1 and 2, P53, P10, and um, because these alterations can come up frequently both in CHIP as well as in um, uh, somatic alterations in cancer. So what questions are we asking in, that's a sort of uh, in terms of the background, but what questions are we really asking in, in early breast cancer? So can we diagnose cancer earlier? That hasn't been so promising in breast cancer, mostly because we already have mammograms. And so the bar is quite high in terms of thinking about um, screening testing, although there are a lot, there's a lot of effort in this area. Um, can we monitor response to treatment in, to either both in the neoadjuvant setting and in the adjuvant setting? And I think this is a really promising area right now. Can we identify minimal residual disease prior to overt metastatic recurrence? And then um, can we do something about that? And then can we identify mutations of resistance, for example, ESR1? But really, we want to know about in all of these questions, we want to understand, can we change the outcomes for patients? Because as we know from that study I showed earlier, the, for the CTCs, as well as earlier screening studies that were done in the mid-90s, that doing those screening tests did not have a, a, an, an impact on patient outcomes. And so these, the tests, the studies that are being done right now really need to address the real clinical utility of these tests for patients. So why is the challenge of testing in early, of CTDNA assessment in early breast cancer different? 
really it comes down to that the level of ctDNA or the tumor fraction is much, much lower than advanced cancer. It ranges from a few parts per million up to an advanced cancer, around 80% of cell-free DNA would be actually coming from the tumor or ctDNA. So it's a quite a broad range and the tests that are being used in the advanced cancer setting are not sens nearly sensitive enough to detect levels in early breast cancer. Each individual tube of blood contains li limited genomic equivalents, limited pieces of, of a genome, because again, the ctDNA level is so low. And so the conventional ctDNA sequencing are insufficiently sensitive. And additionally, in early breast cancer, when we wanna look at multiple mutations, or which is what many of these tests are doing, the tissue informed tests, which seem, which seem to be the most sensitive at this moment, um, we're looking at here on the left, you can see a graph um, sort of a simulation of looking at the tumor fraction in CFDNA on, on, on the bottom as, and on the, um, on, the, on the left side here, the detection power for specific um, DNA input. And if you track just one mutation um, in a patient's, for a patient's cancer, you're able to detect maybe one in, ten, one in 10, 000, um, uh uh, mole mutant molecules in normal. And as you move up to 10, mute tracking 10 mutations from a patient's cancer or 100 mutations or 1,000, you increase your sensitivity significantly um, and move that, uh, that curve to the right. And on the right, you see the rationale for individualized tests. Why in breast cancer do we need to track a patient's um, uh, a tumor informed test rather than just looking at a panel of, say, common mutations? And really, the, this is a, some, a simulation from the, the TCGA um, uh, database. And in breast cancer, we don't have frequent recurrent mutations. And so if you, uh, if you create a panel test, for example, here, if you look at a 10 KB panel test or 100 KB or even a one megabase um, panel test, most of that sequencing will be dedicated to mutations that are not in the patient in front of you's cancer. And so therefore you're sort of wasting that sequencing. And if in, in, instead you track patient specific um, exonic or exonic and intronic mutations, so whole exome or whole genome, you really significantly increase um, the sensitivity of these tests. So that's why we're using tumor informed tests um, in, in breast and other cancers right now. Here's just an illustration of what that, uh, that flow looks like. So a patient's um, tumor would be uh, sequenced um, at the time of primary diagnosis. Okay, that, that sequencing is used to identify uh, either whole exome or whole genome, but tumor um, specific mutations. And then those mutations are used to create a panel test for that's patient specific. And if you look here, you can see that the, um, if you think about each, each individual mutation is a color, because these are molecules are so rare, only if you're, for example, here you're tracking just the orange one, you might catch it, but if you're tracking the yellow one, you would miss it. Whereas if you're tracking all of these different mutations, you're likely to capture, um, you're more likely to capture an individual mutation. And then we, in these studies, the, we then correlate with patient outcomes. So again, just emphasizing that the tumor agnostic versus tumor informed, if we look at a tumor, um, if we use an off-the-shelf panel for patients, um, these are the, the test is the same for all patients, which is ideal if we could do it. And if it's more sensitive, it's certainly easier from a, uh, from a logistics perspective, but not nearly as sensitive as if we use individualized patient um, uh, panel tests. So in multiple studies in breast cancer and in other solid tumors, tumor-informed minimal residual disease detection has been associated with distant recurrence. And it's, it's the curves in, in all of these studies that I'll show you the graphics of are quite impressive. So a few caveats though. Well, first, the positive predictive value in these studies, when you look at a ctDNA test after completion of, of curative intent therapy, that positive predictive value for a positive test approaches 100%, which is really quite impressive. However, the negative predictive value, the, the, um, the uh, likelihood that a negative test means that a patient will not experience recurrence is lower. 
And in all of these studies, it's important to know that the curves really depend on serial testing so that the negative predictive value of an individual test is very low. So it's if you have a positive test, it's it's likely that somebody will experience distant recurrence. If you have a negative test, it's it uh, can be trusted uh, less. Um, Tumor-informed testing that's currently appears to be the most sensitive for the reasons I illustrated before. And really right now, the technology is very rapidly evolving. This data here on the right is from the uh, a, a series of, of patients um, led by uh, Gar Isaac Garcia Marias. We also um, had, a, had a study a few years ago looking at a large cohort of patients. Um, there is a, a study from Coombs et al. from uh, looking uh, also a, a few years ago. And then more recently, the iSpy study has um, uh, Mark ba Magbanwa and, uh, and others have looked at uh, CT DNA via the Signatera test in the iSpy study group and seen that the uh, a positive predictive or positive test was associated with um, uh, risk of distant recurrence. And this was more uh, significant than just looking at PCR or lack of PCR. So we recently had uh, shared some data from la at last ASCO and published in JCO uh, late, uh, mid last year, looking at ctDNA in patients with high risk hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer in the CHIRP study, which is led by a fellow in my group, um, Marla Lipsick Sharp. Um, and we wanted to understand because there was no data in this space is, is a, a positive test associated with distant recurrence, can we detect it at all, ctDNA? And so we took this group of patients with quite high risk disease. You can see here down on the bottom, these patients had T3 and T4 disease or, and or N2, N3 disease, or if they had T1, N1 disease, they had to have at least three lymph nodes involved or high Ka67, high grade or high oncotype. So it's really quite a high risk group of patients. And so we took patients who um, had, uh, provided informed consent. We did not return results to patients because this was a research use only test. Um, and we created uh, radar tests, um, individualized uh, tests tracking up to 51 mutations for the, from these patients. And we collected plasma every six to 12 months and applied um, the radar test to the individual patient's plasma. And one other, sorry, and, and additionally, the patients had been um, uh, were at least five years from diagnosis, but some of them were quite a while out from diagnosis, up to 20 years. So we did see that there was a detection, that the detection of ctDNA in the late adjuvant hormone receptor positive breast cancer was associated with recurrence. We were surprised um, and intrigued to see that in 10% of patients, eight out of 83 patients um, had detectable ctDNA, and that six of 83 patients developed metastatic recurrence. All six of these patients has a, had a positive ctDNA test prior to metastatic recurrence, and the median lead time for this recurrence was 12.4 months, keeping in mind that in this setting, we don't do regular interval scans, and so these patients were, were presenting with clinical metastatic recurrence. One of 83 patients did develop local regional recurrence, and that patient did not have a positive test prior to, um, to uh, local recurrence. Occurrence. Two of the 83 patients did have a positive ctDNA test and had not had clinical recurrence at the time of uh, last follow-up for, for um, the study. So this is all a very exciting data. Um, we These data have not been um, assessed prospectively in patients with breast cancer. So unlike um, the dynamic study in colorectal cancer, where there's um, clinical proven clinical utility of a ctDNA test in breast cancer, right now we have these very intriguing, exciting um, retrospective data, but we do not have any prospective data showing that intervening upon a test like this makes a difference for patients. So that's really the next step here. Additionally, in terms of future directions, we're very interested in whether a tumor agnostic approach um, can identify early breast cancer um, in the blood via ctDNA. And this is data, this is actually from the colorectal um, data from my colleague, uh, Aparna Parikh, um, looking at use of the Gardent tumor agnostic test, which did show um, quite good sensitivity um, and specificity in patients with colorectal cancer. But we 
are testing these kinds of tests in breast cancer, we do not right now have any data to say that, um, that this is effective, but we're hopeful. So in terms of future directions for MRD uh, detection in breast cancer, there are a number of clinical trials underway and in planning for treatment escalation for MRD positive patients. I think this is really the low hanging fruit here is to see whether uh, treatment and intervention upon a positive test makes a difference for patients. More difficult, but also potentially impactful is whether we can uh, both intervene upon these tests and improve DFS and overall survival for patients. Can we uh, achieve uh, an MRD clearance? And is that clinically meaningful? It could be a very exciting um, uh, endpoint for studies, um, similar to what we see with PATH-CR, but in multiple settings, but it needs to be first proven to be um, a meaningful endpoint. And then perhaps more impactful in breast cancer because of how well many of our patients do, can we de-escalate or really tailor treatment for MRD negative patients? Um, but this really requires exquisitely sensitive MRD testing. Right now, those tests are not where they need to be for a single time point to be convincing to, um, to consider uh, tailoring a therapy based on a single time point test. And it requires a better understanding of the circulating tumor DNA biology and the lead time for a test. We don't understand right now whether it's the sensitivity of the tests or whether it's the fact that the, these tumors might not be shedding at all. And that's something that needs to be what we're still working out. CTDNA is testing is promising. I would argue that right now I would I am not using it in my clinic to guide care for patients, although I am enrolling patients on clinical trials um, when they're available. Um, but I'm, I'm optimistic that this will be coming to clinics um, very soon for patients with breast cancer. So I'll stop there and say thank you. Um, and I think go ahead and, and, and take questions. Is, is there any, uh, I know the Guardian 360 for the rectal tumor, we, we use that, but is there anything for breast cancer out there commercially yet, or is this something they're just developing? So the guard, so Guardian 360 is used in breast cancer for um, in advanced cancer. I didn't talk about advanced cancer because we were focusing on early breast cancer, but um, but in it's it's very helpful in advanced cancer, similar to the foundation medicine test. Now there, you know, there's uh, many of these. Tempest has one, Karis has one. The sensitivity in uh, early breast cancer is not, a, it's not appropriate for, for the use there. And so I don't, I, it's not even, I don't think in development in that way. They are developing a new test that I, called like infinity or something that's coming to a uh, clinic near you sometime maybe later this year or, or on some time frame like that but that will um, uh, hope may address both minimal residual disease as well as um, use in the advanced setting but that's not there's no there are no data in breast cancer yet or to my knowledge there are no public data in any tumor types with that test yet thank you Dr. Parson, I, I have um, uh, a couple of questions with regards to, uh, you know, how do you figure out which lab to even use uh, when we know quite well that uh, none of these tests are validated. Mm -hmm. uh, you, they're not reproducible. I mean, you could send a sample to Garden and you may get a positive and you send the same sample to say Tempus, and you may get a negative test. Mm -hmm. You don't know which one to believe. Um, and uh, I, I think the whole, I, 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 you know, I actually I read your article, you know, which is, you know, which is very exciting to even learn uh, that you could detect cancer at such an early stage. Um, I, I'm just very worried what you do with the results. If you do a test, what do you I tell agree. a patient? Oh, by the way, you I know, don't. Yeah. I don't do those tests. So, so I guess I, I want to be really clear and say that I, I think you're right that these are, these tests are so, and, and maybe I should have also expanded it to talk about the advanced cancer setting. Um, but the, in the advanced cancer setting, if we're looking for specific alterations to potentially guide therapy for a patient. So if you want to know, does your, does your patient with breast cancer have a PIK3CA mutation or an ESR1 mutation, or, you know, you're curious about ERBB2 mutations to give neratinib as because you're sort of in, in the late line setting. Those tests, Gardent, um, Tempest, 
Foundation Medicine, Caris, those are all, if they're positive, um, and and with the caveat that that chip can be an issue, the clonal hematopoiesis, especially in p53, BRCA1 and 2. Um, but if those are positive, those are pretty reliable tests. They're not, it's true that when you look at the um, you know, tumor fraction or sort of the 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 concentration of CT DNA from test to test, they're not comparable. And there's a lot of um, there may be there there is a lot of sort of um, uh, QC QC is not quite right, but head to head comparison that needs to be done. Um, and there's a call for that by the FDA and some other um, sort of international organizations that are working on that. But in the advanced cancer setting, if you see a mutation and it's again with the caveat that you're not looking at chip, um, there is I think you can trust those tests that are commercially available. They're they're reliable. However, if you're thinking about looking for an early breast cancer, I think there's a few problems. First of all, those those tests that, that we're most used to, like the Garden 360, Foundation Medicine, Caris, Tempus, those are not appropriate for this setting because the CT DNA level is just too low. It is, um, you know, the, the limit of detection on those tests is at about 0.1%. And the, the fraction of um, in these situations is down to like, you know, one in 10,000, one in a million, it goes, you know, sort of end down. So those tests aren't gonna capture um, this kind of uh, circulating tumor DNA. It's possible, and sometimes we do see that patients with, um, without metastatic disease, but with, um, with minimal residual disease that their tumor fractions are high, but most of them are quite low. And so they're the only test that's right now available um, in clinics that's for this use is the Signatera test. However, there's no, there are no data in breast cancer saying that, like, as you pointed out, that, that seeing a positive test, what do you do with that information? We don't know what to do with that information yet. And there's no, there are no data that um, tell us what to do or that doing something and acting on that test will make a difference for patients. So I would recommend against ordering these tests right now for early breast cancer until we have um, more data saying that there is clinical utility for these for these tests for patients with breast cancer. And colorectal cancer is totally different. I mean, I think now we do have data and I, I don't take care of colorectal cancer patients, but those data are available now from the dynamic study and are coming with additional studies saying that it could make a difference for patients, um, but in breast cancer, we're not there yet. Is there anything similar, similar but, I was gonna say, to the dynamic study being done in early stage breast cancer? So it's harder because the the event rate is so much lower in breast cancer to do those those kinds of studies, and because it takes a longer time. The studies that are happening um, in breast cancer are more escalation of therapy for patients who have residual disease after um, completion of neoadjuvant therapy. So they, you know, there are a few studies looking at there's in triple negative breast cancer looking at taking patients who've had um, note to have residual disease and then get a, an MRD test. If that test is positive, they can receive additional therapy. Um, but the problem there is that question about what, what therapy to give them because those patients at that point have had such a lot of therapy. Um, and so in the late uh, adjuvant breast cancer space, there's also, there are a few tests or a few studies that are going to look at um, adding or changing endocrine therapy based on um, a positive test. So that I think is also another place where it could be impactful. I just it would be great question. if we could have one like that with the dynamic study. Yeah, yeah I just sorry, have go one ahead. Another question. Sure. Um, so you know, when when you have a patient who actually had breast cancer, you know the genomic profile of that particular tumor. So you mm -hmm. you have already identified that. So when you're trying to actually look for MRD, I, I, I use the word MRD, I, I, I'm reluctant to use that in solid tumors, but um, uh, why, uh, why can't we just do like whole exome with messenger RNA, uh, um, you know, sequencing, or, you know, RNA sequencing versus actually doing, you know, uh, are we, have we gone beyond circulating uh, uh, tumor DNA and gotten more granular in terms of looking at, you know, exomes? Yeah, so there, 
it, and you're thinking about early early cancer or in the yeah, yeah i'm talking early because we already know the profile right we know the genomic profile we know what to look okay. for mm -hmm. so the, so the circulating you. RNA is really intriguing and exciting. It's much, much earlier in development from just an analyte perspective. It's not, there, there hasn't been as much work done and it's not as ro robust. And so um, there are, a, there is a lot of work going on right now to look at circulating RNA, but it's much earlier in development because of the challenges with just the reproducibility and the, um, the sensitivity of the assays in the blood. Um, but it's a great idea, and I think you're right. It's just we we haven't we're not there yet in terms of the technology. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, sure. You mentioned one of the applications in the early slides again was obviously looking for early detection. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you have any experience uh, with the Grail <laughs> test. I I seem to be getting results sent to me almost weekly now, and uh, I was looking through the report the other day and the sensitivity in early stage breast cancer was surprisingly low. Yeah, it's really poor. And I, it's they didn't, the mammogram. Yes, exactly. And I think that's a, the problem is there, you know, there, the, the levels, well, there's a few problems. One is the, we have mammograms. And so we, you have to, you know, when, for most tumor types, there's no screening test. And so it's a pretty low bar to get over in terms of, um, of identifying new cancers. And then the, um, the, sh the small, the most common cancers are low shedding, the, the hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancers. And so the sensitivity of those tests has been fairly low. The GRAIL and um, the, uh, what's, it's the other, I forget the name of the other test. It's a, the group out of Hopkins that's doing, um, developing a similar or a, a sort of competing test. And, and that also showed fairly low sensitivity for breast cancer. So I, you know, I'm, I hope that that will change. And there's a, there's a lot of interest in both, you know, the first tests looked at just sequencing, just the DNA code, other, the Grail actually incorporates a lot of methylation um, is where they get a lot of their sensitivity from. And now there's interest in what we call fragmentomics. So the, the, the way that the, um, the, the ctDNA is sort of wrapped around histones when it's when it's uh, released, and you can read um, depending on what's ex being expressed. You can read the the um, what's degraded and what's left, and determine where that um, where that piece of DNA is coming from. And so you can gather quite a lot of information from fragmentomics from methylation, from the sequencing. And so it's possible that these will be integrated in some uh, in some fashion to increase the sensitivity of those assays. But right now the basic, you know, straight up sequencing or methylation assays don't seem very sensitive for breast cancer. And it may be too that there is just not, it's there's not a lot of being shed. And so those sensitivities will not be possible with breast cancer for, for early detection. I hope that's- well, Illumina is but... pushing it pretty hard and, and their, their yeah. message is confusing to patients because a lot of the women that send me the test say, isn't this great? I don't have to get a mammogram. Yeah, no, it's, I think that, you know, one of the fascinating things about, about diagnostics is that we just don't have the same um, infrastructure and regulatory uh, regulations for these tests. And so the messaging is, is pretty crazy. So a lot of the times about what the test can do and what the, um, and what they're, um, what they can and what they can't do. And so I agree, there's a, there's quite a lot of confusion around um, what's available and what it means for individual patients. Um, and, you know, I, I hope that these are effective screening tests, but also that we don't, you know, not or stop mammograms in patients who, who still do need them. Anybody else have a question they'd like to ask? Well, you've answered all the questions. <laughs> uh, with that, I'll go ahead and thank everybody for participating uh, tonight. And I wish everybody a pleasant night. Uh, Dr. Parsons, thanks uh, for a great presentation and have a good night as well. Thanks so much. Good to see you. And thanks for all the questions. Thank have you. a good night. Bye-bye. Nice.